Black Seminole. He is descended from Africans who escaped slavery and united with the Seminole Indians in Florida more than two centuries ago. There's no future without a fact. It's a fact. If you're coming from nowhere, you're going nowhere. 1776. Thirteen American colonies rebel against British rule, but Florida remains loyal to England. The river dividing Georgia and Florida becomes an international border. Hundreds of blacks, enslaved on American plantations, escape south, finding refuge and allies among the Seminole Indians in northern Florida. Enraged slave owners enlist the United States government to destroy the Black and Seminole Alliance. But in 50 years of fight, the bond between Black and Seminole is not broken. Seminoles is unique. Their existence as a people proved that whites failed to destroy the alliance they most feared. They knew if there was ever a joint effort that they wouldn't be able to control. They couldn't control either, either race, the black or the Indian. The Indians were scared. But then had the blacks, some of them were domesticated by the whites. They knew their ways, they knew their, their weaknesses. So together, what do you get? A formidable form. Because they, they, they're stronger together. American slave owners feared the united strength of the Africans they had enslaved and the Indians whose land they had stolen. This combined African and Indian force soon became Florida's best defense against American invaders. A 1783 treaty ended the American Revolution. Control of Florida returned to Spain, the territory's original colonial ruler. As the Spanish moved into St. Augustine, the Americans demanded the return of escaped slaves. But the Spanish had other plans. Historian Jane Landers discovered records documenting that the Spanish encouraged a military alliance between blacks and Indians. Sometimes you will see on the list detachments of the Free Black Militia specifically posted out at Indian villages. The Black and Indian Militias were the, the military force on the frontier. So the Spanish would be negotiating at diplomatic levels with the United States, but they would send out the Indians and the Blacks to do the fighting. And the Free Blacks in St. Augustine were very connected many times to the Blacks that were living in the Seminole villages. What we now call the Seminoles were living in their own villages, uh, for instance, very large settlements near what is now Gainesville, Florida, in the Alachua Savannah area. A close relationship developed between Seminoles and Blacks on this prairie. Some white observers mistakenly assumed the Blacks were slaves to the Seminoles. It really was not a slave-master relationship. It was more a, a free existence, playing and marrying. The children were accepted in the tribes quite easily. 
and they had a common interest in wanting to hold that land where they were living freely. They had acquired big herds of cattle themselves, they had nice fields and homes. But Georgian slave owners raged against the black and Seminole alliance. They demanded that the U.S. government capture the former slaves and their children, even if it meant invading Spanish Florida, which they did in 1812. Blacks and Indians fought so fiercely and with such determination that they routed the Georgians who were invading Florida. They even fought and defeated a U.S. Marine contingent that was assisting those Georgians. But within a few months, the Georgians were back with threat troops. They invaded the prairie, pillaged the towns, burned hundreds of log homes. These few excavated remains would tell of a settled life destroyed forever. The Seminoles scattered south. Many of the black Seminoles disappeared to a place where the invading Americans would not find them for a long time. The Seminoles were, were pretty well crippled and dispersed in a number of different directions beginning about 1813. One of the spots they came, I think, was in this vicinity here. This map, drawn more than 150 years ago in the diary of an American military engineer, led anthropologist Brent Wiseman to this remote location on the Withlacoochee River. The diary's author, Henry Prince called this place Boggy Island. We're now in the middle of Boggy Island, high and dry, in the midst of river swamp all around. This is the area described by Henry Prince as being cleared and cultivated by the Black Seminoles during the Second Seminole War period. It was in this area here, now overgrown as a very beautiful mesic hammock, that the Black Seminoles grew corn, beans, several varieties of squash, pumpkins, and along the edge of the river, sugarcane. We know very little about how these black Seminoles were living. We don't know what their settlement looked like. We don't know anything about their daily lives. On the other hand, we have a very informative historical resource below our feet, a relatively undisturbed archaeological site out here somewhere waiting to be further explored. And it's quite possible that archaeology will hold the key to developing a real history of these black Seminoles in Florida. The black Seminoles at Boggy Island stayed out of sight, while another group of blacks occupied this highly visible spot, the location of what was called Negro Fort on the Apalachicola River in Spanish Florida. The British built this fort during the War of 1812. They retreated in 1814, and left the fort and extensive artillery to blacks and Indians settled along the river. American slave owners detested this evidence of black strength so close to their plantations. Young General Andrew Jackson ordered the fort destroyed, regardless of the ground it stands on. On July 27, 1814, a lucky shot from an American frigate hit the fort's magazine. The explosion killed almost 300 blacks and Indians. In 1817, Jackson invaded Spanish Florida with the excuse of routing out blacks and Indians. The Spanish didn't stop the Americans, and by 1821, Florida belonged to the United States. New settlers pushed into Florida, demanding more and more of the valuable Seminole lands. Violence between settlers and Seminoles continued, even after the U.S. government restricted the Seminoles to a reservation. Slave catchers made a living kidnapping black Seminoles. As president, Andrew Jackson demanded that all Seminoles be removed west and that all black Seminoles be sold into slavery. The Seminoles refused. Thousands of U.S. troops occupied the Florida Territory.
1835, the Seminole resistance galvanized into war. The older ancestors, they used to tell us about that um, kid. And they said that they fought down there in the Seminole War for seven years. in the first place was that it was a basic cause of war. The erection of these forts, Foster, and certain others, I think, indicated beyond any doubt to the uh, Indians that the United States wanted in the long run to push them out because several of the forts, like Fort Foster, were in the reservation. And there wouldn't be any basic purpose in having the forts in the reservation if you were going to leave the Indians in it, leave them alone. The constant uh, leakage of slaves from South Carolina, Georgia, down here, was so aggravated the slaveholders that they were determined to wipe out this refuge. The blacks were among the more important guides. They were the sole interpreters. There wasn't anybody else who could interpret. And as warriors, they, as long as they were on the Indian side, the, the people at the time uh, always stated that the blacks were as good fighters as the Indians, if not better. Uh, and so their significance is major. I think you would find that the freedmen were the ones that were doing most of the fight. Mm -hmm. And they fought to be free. The high command just changed his position several times. At one point, he said, every slave that can be uh, demonstrated to have belonged to a white has to go back to the whites. And if the Indians don't turn them in, we'll hang anyone who catch, who wasn't turned in or who didn't turn them in. But Jessup's end position, after several flip-flops, was uh, we aren't going to make slave catchers out of the United States Army. The Seminoles fought until the U.S. government agreed that the black Seminoles would also be allowed to go to this. While some Seminoles never left the Florida swamps, the majority of Seminoles, Indian and black, sailed from Tampa Bay up the Mississippi and Arkansas rivers to Indian territory. Seminoles joined thousands of southeastern Indians, forced west by the U.S. government. This countryside now bears the name of Seminole County, Oklahoma. It is headquarters for the Seminole Nation in the West. Twin brothers, Lawrence and Lance Cudjo, stay deeply involved in the affairs of the Seminole Nation even while Lance recovers from a severe stroke. Their ancestor, King Cudjo, was a translator and advisor to the Seminoles in Florida. Lawrence meets with Seminole Chief Tanyan. They prepare for a council meeting later that night. Seminoles are called Seminole Freedmen. Two of the 14 tribal bands of the Seminole Nation are Freedmen bands. Seminole Freedmen have full tribal status, unlike any other group of blacks associated with Native peoples. The Freedmen were so well in time with the Seminole tribe that they adopted them being a full citizen of the Seminole Nation. And that doesn't come to me a lot different than the Creeks and all the rest of them. Because they really weren't good about it. In fact, there was a lot of men, young men in that tribe. Ben Warrior is the head of the Dosa Barkas clan. Ben Warrior's 
ancestors came to Indian Territory as independent tribal members to farm the land and live free. first arrived at Fort Gibson on the Arkansas River, slave catchers were close behind. Many black Seminoles stayed at the fort and built this commissary for the government. The army protected them from slave catchers, but still called them slaves. The persecution continued. In 1849, blacks among the Seminoles were legally declared slaves. In defiance, Seminole war hero John Horse and his partner, Wildcat, rebelled. They led 300 followers out of Indian Territory into Mexico. They chose Mexico, I mean, because um, it was supposed to be free, okay, to do what you want. If they had stayed over here, they'd be back in slavery again. The Seminoles lived near the Rio Grande for 20 years where they served as border patrol for the Mexican government. The Seminoles' expertise as horsemen and sharpshooters made an impression, even on the American side of the world, where they were still considered slaves. Soon after the Civil War abolished slavery in the United States, the U.S. Army recruited the Seminoles as border scouts. They were stationed here. Fort Clark, Texas. The Army promised wages and land. They came in here to help the United States government. In 1870, to form the scouts, the scout for the government. That's why they came back. They promised some land and that they would take care of them. And each man that came over and they used him as a scout, they did the same thing as a private. And then they would let the rest of the family stay on the land. But the guy that your scouts would take care of the rest of the black of the people, you know, and the families. And that's the way they did. They stayed together. And if I had, you had. The Seminole Scouts served the U.S. government for 34 years. They earned three Congressional Medals of Honor. <laughs> Descendants of the Seminole Scouts had to obtain permission to visit this land of Fort Clark, where their parents and grandparents once had homes. The army kept them down until they started to speak soon enough, and after they didn't use them any longer, you know, they
private ownership of land. Anthropologist Rebecca Bateman spent a year conducting research among the freedmen in Seminole County. In 1897, a tribal law was created in which uh, the attempt was made to list all of the Indian and freedmen members of the tribe in preparation for preparing the allotment law. If we turn out the old rule right here, and if you were who came to draw with some of the Indians or your ancestors and they won the rules, well, they come on down to by name of descent. They allocated land. We got the map. You know, everybody they issued that land to. Some of them did real well because they got land that had all reserves on it. Because that means got the way we had some of the same conditions we had down in there was a massive grab for land by white speculators who did so by taking advantage of the uh, illiterate allottees, both Indian and black, but particularly the freedmen. See, a lot of things that uh, she found in documents that was extremely negative. They made the cut, they stayed the band. They actually leave that out. That's why I started in this books. Yeah, I don't put in this book there how they got it a lot of this land and how they did it. I put that in this books. People today, especially elderly people, some of whom are old enough to have been original Latins, they remember this period very well. Helen Thurman, born in 1902, was listed on the allotment rolls as a newborn. No, I think you do. That's right. You see that what I thought? Yeah. Let me come in. Yeah. I've got a good fire on a newborn. Yeah, a newborn. Uh-huh. It's called the newborn. It's got 40 acres. Okay. Yeah, some got 60s. Uh, the older one. First class land. It's got 60 acres. Yeah, baby. Children with Seminole heritage, like Frederica Cudjo, must rely on grandparents to pass on their unique history. Well, I found out that uh, my grandfather was uh, a freedman in the Seminole. I never knew that. And I never knew that he, you, he used to be, live in Seminole. The attendance list of this class shows mostly Anglo names, passed on from slavery days, while Frederica Cudjo's West African surname tells of centuries of black independence. An independence made possible by the Seminole Alliance. One nation under God. As we gather 
Secondly, I would like to relate some of the history that the Seminole Indians were part of. Robert Payne was born in Florida before the Seminole tribe was removed to Indian territory. While in his 30s, he enlisted into the Seminole Federal Indian Scouts on November 12. This is more than a commemoration for heroic ancestors. These descendants of the Seminole Scouts are self-appointed historians committing to public record an American past which their children do not learn in school. They try to keep all of this from the black. You don't hear that much in the history books about any black. Let them know your parents were slaves, your parents weren't, or whatever the case may be. But in order for them to get it together now, they've got to know where they come from. This is just a brief history of the Seminole Negro Scouts in which we are all part of that system. Yeah. 